What up African world, it's Home Team here and I'm back at it with another video of African history, culture, and worldview. And I want to start yet another series where I speak on historical African figures throughout ancient, medieval, and modern history. So today, we're going to talk about one of the most popular kings in African history, King Taharka of Kush. <laughs> And as always, if you want to support the home team, you can do so on Patreon.com. I have new rewards for you guys, so be sure to check that out. Also, go to Afrographics.com, a website where you can find unique illustrative infographics summarizing African history. All links to Patreon, Afrographics, and home team merchandise are in the description box below. Taharka tends to be one of our more famous ancient African kings, but if you were to actually ask somebody why, they probably couldn't even tell you. I myself have found it difficult to understand why I like Taharka so much. In all honesty, he wasn't even the most successful African king in the ancient world, yet he was so popular even in his time. In a weird way, Taharka states himself how much of a well-liked guy he was. Here's what he has to say. I was brought from Nubia amongst the royal brothers that his majesty had brought. As I was with him, he liked me more than all his brothers and all his children so that he distinguished me. I won the heart of the nobles and was loved by all. It was only after the hawk had flown to heaven that I received the crown in Memphis. Now I don't know about you guys, but it does seem as though he himself was a little confused about why he was so beloved, but he most certainly embraced it. Even rumors of movies being made about him circulated by Will Smith for quite some time as we can't seem to get enough of him. But to sum it up, I think we like Taharka because of the confidence he exuded and his projection of power, something he accomplished at a very young age. The first mention of Taharka that comes to our attention comes from his uncle Shibiku. Now we aren't technically sure if it was Shibiku or Shabaka, but it's not really of the greatest importance, right? We know that a royal family member, either Shibiku or Shabaka, was supporting Tyre, Jerusalem, and Ashdod in withholding tribute to Assyria. Assyria at this time was very powerful in conquering territory rapidly, so it was definitely in the best interest of Kush to check Assyria as much as possible. And this is where Taharka comes on the scene. A young prince in his own right, 20 years of age, was summoned by his uncle to provide support and wage war in the north, the north being the Middle East. This is what Taharka had to say. My mother was in Taseti, now I was far from her as a 20 year old recruit as I went with his majesty to the Northland. During his 20s, Taharka was ensuring some cities in the Levant like Jerusalem wouldn't get swallowed up by the Assyrians. The young African prince apparently participated in the Battle of El Teca. Now the result of the battle is unclear as both sides claim victory, which usually means it was probably a stalemate. But Taharka's aid against the Assyrians in defending Levantine cities and allying with them gave him a lot of popularity amongst those people, and he was even mentioned in their literature. So before Taharka even became king, he was already highly accomplished. He finally ascended the throne in 690 BC, becoming the king of Kush and Egypt. He was a mighty African king of the ancient world. His reign is commonly divided into two periods. His first decade was generally peaceful, blessed with extensive commerce and all other sorts of contact with the Phoenician coast, while his second period was characterized by conflict with Assyria. Taharka donated to the Temple of Amun at Kawa, a statue of him smiting foreign peoples, alluding to some very hostile activity in the Middle East. In March 673 BC, the Kushites swept the floor with the Assyrians in the invasion of Egypt. It seems clear that the Assyrians were fed up with Taharka's power and influence in the Levant region. And so, just two years later, the Assyrians came back and conquered the northern part of Egypt. Unfortunately, this battle really changed the demeanor of Taharka because not only did he get wounded in the fight, but some of his own family members were captured by the Assyrians. The Assyrian king, Ashardun, even sat on Taharka's throne. The Kushites were effectively expelled from Lower Egypt or northern Egypt, and could not at all threaten the Assyrians in the Levant region temporarily. However, Taharka seems to have come back and reconquered northern Egypt 
and retook the delta in 668 or early 667 BC as he's recognized as the king of Upper and Lower Egypt. But the Assyrians once again rallied to take Northern Egypt and the city of Memphis and were successful. They pushed back the Kushites and Taharqa was forced back into Thebes. The Assyrians wanted to end Taharqa for good and so they came down the Nile to challenge Taharqa once more. But Taharqa, being the determined African king he was, he was able to defeat the Assyrians near Thebes so that the Assyrians could not go further south and actually penetrate Kush. Taharqa must have been extremely determined because the Egyptian records tell us that Taharqa's enemies ran away in utter fear. But the Egyptians at the time were very pro-Nubia so as not to be ruled by the Assyrians, so they may have been exaggerating. Anyway, when the puppet rulers of northern Egypt heard of Taharqa's victory, they were encouraged to revolt against the Assyrian overlords, but the rebellion was put down. Assyrian rule over northern Egypt at times was ignored and the priests in the north acknowledged Taharqa as the legitimate ruler of Memphis and the Delta. The Assyrians could not muster up a force nor were militarily powerful enough over the Kushites to take all of Egypt, the north and the south. So they were just subject to the north and the Kushites under Taharqa continued to reign in Thebes from the south. However, Taharqa's heart seemed to have been very heavy as he could not take back northern Egypt. It's because of this sequence of events that we see some of the most beautiful written literature from an African king called Taharqa's Prayer. It's a lengthy prayer by Taharqa himself to the god Amun. The prayer deals with the loss of the north, his requests to Amun, the safety of his family, and a reminder about the favor Amun has shown him in the past. Here are two brief quotes from his prayer. You gave me upper and lower Egypt. You chose me among them, and you caused to be said. These are my two lands, indeed. It is according to what he desires that a moon makes a pharaoh. O oh, a moon, O oh, you who did not abandon what he has created while it is half realized, do not let me enter an affair that you hate. Taharqa's prayer is just an absolute brilliant poetic piece that is of tremendous value to us in the diaspora because we literally get to be inside the heart and the mind of an ancient African king. I really encourage all of you to read it. Well, I'm Allah, guys. Hopefully you were able to learn some new things about one of the most popular African kings. If you like these videos and would like to help out in its continued production, you can support me on Patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. Know thyself. Remember your ancestors. Peace.